So, um, I might as well kick this off and, and thank everyone for, for coming to, uh, to our first virtual presentation. Um, there's a lot less to say uh, than usual because there's no pizza, there's no bar um, or fire exit instructions. But um, we do have a ReSharper giveaway subscription, so you can get a JetBrain subscription today as well. Um, we've got Shania in the chat and myself. So if you wanted to, um, you can give us a little message to say you want to participate. Um, or you could just tweet us at .NET Liverpool, um, hashtag ReSharper giveaway, and we'll put you in the draw. We'll also be monitoring our Twitter and our, all of our social media. So if you fancy doing as well, uh, please give us a tweet and drop any, um, any messages in there that you want. Um, any issues at all, technical or otherwise, please don't hesitate to give me a message and uh, we'll try our best to help you out. Um, want to thank as well TLA, um, they're our sponsors this evening um, for their continuous support and ReSharper as well for um, giving us our JetBrain license this evening. Um, and with that note, I'm going to pass you over with great excitement to welcome John Skeet um, as our presenter this evening. Thanks, John. Hi, folks. Um, so just as quick introduction -y, um aspects, um, let me, uh, I can't spotlight, but right. Um, I haven't given this talk, I don't think, I think I've given it once over remote. I don't know whether it was Zoom or something else before. Um, it's a bit of an odd talk in general, whether you see it live or, or here, it does have the benefit when I'm giving it from my shed, uh, that it's a talk about drum kits and um, we're here with my actual drum kit in, in the flesh. And in fact, as it happens, I've got a second drum module uh, down here, um, just at the moment for testing purposes. Um, it will become a bit more clear what drum modules are over time. Um, this is a, an odd talk because every time I give it, the, the um, landscape has changed because I've spent a bunch more time writing code in the meantime. So even if you, maybe you've seen this talk at NDC or seen a video or whatever, um, hopefully there will be different stuff. And it's a really indulgent talk because it's just, hey, I had some spare cash and spare time, so thought I'd learn drumming and start spending time coding as well. And now I get to talk to all you lovely folks um, too. Um, it's very much a what takes my fancy kind of talk because there are so many bits that I could go into that would take far longer and my voice would really, really dry up. It's likely to dry up by the end anyway. Um, but it does mean if you spot something either in the slides or in the code and you would like me to drill into anything in particular, I'm very, very happy to do so. That's no problem at all. Otherwise, I have a tendency to just ramble. I will do what I find interesting and hope that other people do too. Um, if you ask any questions in the chat in Zoom, um, then I will occasionally try to uh, move my eyes downwards to, to check the chat. Um, and if not, Josh will uh, read things out every so often uh, after unmuting himself. Um, that's likely to be the easiest way of going rather than people randomly unmuting themselves. Um, if you're not getting any attention despite things in chat and stuff, then do uh, feel free to unmute yourself and just say hi. Um, one point, I will be starting my screen share in a sec. When I was screen sharing last week, uh, last Friday, uh, with a group in Romania, um, someone, presumably not actually from the group, but who picked up the URL from somewhere, uh, decided to start uh, drawing on the screen share with racist comments and stuff. Um, if that happens, I will just stop the screen share and you'll have to look at my face for the rest of the evening, which is unfortunate, really. Um, but fingers crossed, it won't happen. That's the only time it, it has happened to me. So give me a tick to just share my screen. And okay, hopefully you can all see my PowerPoint um, and probably the screen sharing thing, which I will move out of the way. Okay, so tonight we're talking about uh, what I have learned and what I'm continuing to learn and really, really enjoy from playing with my drum kit. And I say playing with both in terms of actually, you know, uh, hitting the drums and just enjoying playing with it in code. And obviously tonight is more about the code. Um, the main point that I would like you to get across tonight is nothing to do with, we'll talk a bit about immutability and performance maybe and testing and all of these things that are important in themselves, 
um, and I would hope interesting, but really my motivation today is for you to go to bed tonight and want to set your alarm for an hour earlier than normal so that you can get on with either some personal project that you started a while ago and just lost a bit of interest or, or found you didn't have enough time and then um, just it, it got away from you or something that you've always thought Joe it would be really fun to write a tool to do whatever but it's such a big thing that I'll never get started so I really want to um, I hate to say that I want to inspire you but I want you to end up being inspired by yourself more than by me just to have some fun and grow as a developer from it. So we will do some talking about C Sharp, but mostly the goal is um, enjoy me enjoying my drums and think about how you could enjoy it as well. So uh, to introduce bits of the drum kit to you, this is a uh, TD17 KVX by the looks of it, uh, which is what I used to have as my drum kit. I now have a slightly upgraded one. Um, but the, the interesting bits here are we have a hi-hat and um, a couple of crash cymbals and a ride cymbal. We have um, some toms and a snare in the middle, um, a kick pedal and kick drum at the bottom. But the most important bit is over on the left-hand side, and I'm sure there's a way I can sort of highlight it, but um, I'm not that proficient in Zoom. Uh, this box on the left-hand side that's you can just about, or I can just about see that it says acoustic on the very small screen, and that is called the module. Um, it's also known as the brains of an electric drum kit, uh, but module is, is the normal technical term. And basically, that is what takes all the wires, uh, note there are no wires in this picture, so this is a useless drum kit at the moment. Um, it takes all the signals from the wires and turns them into sound and it turns them into MIDI signals as well, and you can um, change the configuration of the kit so that it sounds, so currently I've got my kit set to funk rock, so um, the toms just sound like normal toms. If I change to be on a different kit, um, so uh, let's have something a bit weird, electro drums. Hopefully that's coming across in Zoom um, as, some very definitely electronic drums that sound very different. So you get to set which which kit your drum kit is actually playing at the moment. So it's as if you had a hundred drum kits around the room and you could sit at any one. And then you could also say, well, you know, this drum kit's fine, but this, uh, it's ride cymbal sounds like it's a bit smaller than I want it to be. I want a larger ride cymbal, not changing the actual physical size of the, the uh, cymbal, but just making it a bit deeper by being larger. And you can tune all of that stuff. When I bought this drum kit, um, I have a very good friend, Alice, who was uh, encouraging me to get into drumming. And um, we went to our local music shop and I looked at this and I also looked at the rather cheaper TD1 DMK. And the main difference, I mean, they both have mesh heads. It's nicer heads on, on this TD17 but basically the module was significantly simpler. And even back when I was in the music shop, I thought to myself, I wonder how programmable this is. So I could see that there was a lot you could configure. I had no idea just how much, um, but I thought, I wonder, I can see there's a USB port. I wonder what I can do with the USB. And even back then I had this idea of a tree view, which I will show you in a minute what that's ended up as, um, with configuring the kit. Okay, so that's the drum kit. The module's the important bit. I have my TD27 module on at the moment and connected so that we can actually, um, when I show you V-Drum Explorer, we can um, do things with the actual kit. Um, I should say the code that I've been writing is all to do with Roland V-Drums. Other electronic drum kit manufacturers are available. I have no idea. I'm sure that my code wouldn't work with them but you might or might not be able to write similar code for Yamaha or Pearl or, or whatever. Okay, uh, so I will now show you briefly, um, roughly what it is that we're building. And I'm gonna be daring and show you the new version. I'll explain the two versions in a minute. So uh, in fact, I do have 
it, it's going to come up very small at the moment and you won't be able to see much. Um, I haven't presented with this, the new version, which I'm going to stop as soon as it starts. Um, so I don't know whether my theoretical WPF changes that should make it all come um, bigger will actually work. This is taking far longer to start up than normal. I think Zoom is probably uh, thrashing my system a bit. Come on. There we go. Okay, uh, so it's come up and that's it in small mode, as it were. Uh, now let's see if I can um, increase the sizes a bit. So uh, probably want menu font size and the button. Right. So. Let's make that 20. Okay. And I think some of this will not line up terribly well. I need to do more work on, on this and maybe this is the next feature is to really make it work well in uh, presentation mode versus using it locally mode. Um, and hopefully it will at least be quicker to start this time. There we go. Right, good. Uh, things are a bit bigger at least. I have no idea at the moment how that looks on Zoom. I can't see what my own screen share looks like. But you can see this is the VDRUM Explorer home and you can see it has detected uh, that it's connected to a TD27. And because of that, these device options are available and I could load, yeah, I, I'm currently on kit 53, which is electro drums, and I could load a kit from the module. We come up with a dialog box which isn't sized properly, but we can then see, ignore it saying kit one, this is actually kit 53, but kit explorer at the moment always shows kit one. Um, and we can see what's on electro drums. So previously when I hit Tom three, it was playing the fat box snare. Um, and in fact, I can, get it to play that um, directly. So that's playing over MIDI and we can hear the other things like the, the Tom 2 rim uh, has a noise three and a ratchet, which is gonna be some weird sound effect. So there we go. So those are things you can do when it's connected. Um, but in fact, any of you could run this code. I'll show you the GitHub link later on um, because it also works in sort of offline mode when you don't have a system there or the right system. So for example, I've got a VDRUM file for the TD17, the module that I've got down by my side, but which is turned off. And because it's turned off, I can't actually play the note. Um, I could do with disabling the MIDI channel and attack, but that can come later. So the main part of this, the idea, is that you've got all these kits and you can see this is the module explorer um, but I could I can do things with everything in the module explorer or I can focus into a single kit so open copying kit explorer then brings up exactly the same data for the more cowbell kit and I can edit that so I can change it from a birch tom 4 rim uh, to let's make it a snare drum and we'll make it a maple snare and you know, things happen. All it is is editing data. It's editing a lot of data with a few interesting aspects to it that you might not um, see in most business apps. Okay, that's uh, the, the gist of things. I've got a couple of extra dialogues so you can record all the instruments by saying, um, Okay, drum kit, uh, I'm gonna reset what's on kit number 100 um, to be a blank slate, and then repeatedly just play the kick note, having changed the instrument to play. So it starts off with off, and then some normal kick instruments, and then some snares, etc. The drum kit doesn't care what you've got associated with which um, pad. So I could put a snare drum on the ride cymbal and every time I hit the ride, it will sound like a snare drum. It, it doesn't mind that at all. And then I can just record the samples 
across my normal computer audio. So uh, you know, the Yeti stereo microphone is what I'm talking to you with now. Um, but Master 5 TD27 that it picked by default is what would come through. If I change the zoom input to Master 5 TD27, then every time I hit it, it would come quite possibly very loudly uh, into your homes. So there's, there's a few other bits and pieces and the details really don't matter too much at all. Um, I will dive into some of them where they present interesting programming challenges, but I wanted you to see the kind of thing that I was uh, imagining way back last July and uh, that I've now implemented three times in fact. and I'll tell you a bit about that. But first, how do we talk to this thing at all? I tend to imagine and the, the documentation, first thing, Roland has produced really good documentation for this. It's fantastic. It shows you all of those different fields. I didn't have to do reverse engineering to work all, all of that out. It's all documented in a PDF, a separate PDF for the TD17, and TD27 and TD50. They all use the same data requests and data set commands, but they've got effectively a different schema. I'll come back to schemas. All of this is over MIDI, um, but it's over MIDI via USB in my setup. I believe it would work if you actually had a dedicated MIDI port on your system and plugged it in via the MIDI port on the, on the module. But the way that MIDI 1 works is each channel is unidirectional. So there are two MIDI devices um, on my computer as it were and one is the input and one is the output and you can tell the difference between them you can see that they are input or output devices and they both have the same name midi 2 is actually bi-directional i'm not sure that there are any midi 2 real devices out yet certainly none of the drum kits are maybe a firmware update will spot that will start supporting it we then need the operating system to start supporting it and then apis and then i could start writing to it but until then, we've got this weird two unidirectional channel, uh, channels. And most of the time in, in normal MIDI, you end up um, sending things like play note middle C or silence all the notes now or what, you know, adjust the pitch or whatever it is. But there are also these system exclusive commands. Um, the idea being that those are mostly uh, manufacturer specific and um, there are a couple that are sort of manufacturer agnostic that are identifying uh, what devices are on the other end of the, the MIDI channel. Um, but Roland has these data request and data set. And if you imagine that there's a big block of memory with all of the configuration you've seen, so all of the 100 drum kits and a uh, a single byte that says what's the currently selected drum kit and other things that configure which actual physical pads have I got connected. So I happen to have a PDX-12 as my TOM3, uh, two PDX-8s as my TOMs1 and 2, um, another PDX-8 as my auxiliary 3, and I'll come back to that when I demonstrate the console app. Um, but the um, there's, there's data within the module that says, hey, I know what these triggers are, with the one, two exceptions of the snare and the ride, which are digital over USB, and there's configuration for those, but I can't tell which is which, which means that I've got a, a gap in my uh, configuration at the moment for how you configure digital triggers. So you've got this big block of memory, and Fundamentally, all you want to do is say, I would like to copy stuff out of the memory sometimes, and sometimes I would like to copy stuff into the memory. Um, the schema that's described in the documentation lends itself to thinking of what I call a container. I don't think they're actually called anything particular in the docs, but the, the docs show um, something like this. This is the what I call the root container. And it says it starts at address zero um, and then has other things that these are all hex addresses, but seven bit addresses, which I'll explain in a minute. So this is the root container and that contains the current container, setup, trigger, and a hundred kit containers. Then within um, a kit container, you've got all these sub containers uh, because you've got different configurations 
this is 1 to 20 for the TD-17 because the TD-17 has effectively 20 different instruments to configure. Um, so one for the kick, one for the snare head, snare rim, Tom 1 head, Tom 2 head, etc. Um, sorry, Tom 1 head, Tom 1 rim, Tom 2 head, Tom 2 rim, etc. Um, the TD-27 has all of those plus crash 2 plus three orcs things instead of two orcs things so you end up being i think it's 24 instead of 20 but there are all these containers and then finally you get to uh containers like this this is actually meant to be demonstrating something else but within what i call a field container this doesn't contain other containers it contains the actual information um so in this case uh offset zero is reserved doesn't have any other information in offsets one to four contain four bytes but we only use the lower nibbles of them for the tuning for a kick drum so that you can tune it to be higher or lower pitch so to, to recap that you've got um big bank of memory divided into containers and every container either contains fields or it contains other containers that's what our scheme is going to represent later on and all we need to do with our interactions with the memory is ask for data from the field containers. There's no point in asking for a container of containers because fundamentally, eventually it only ever contains field containers. Um, there are limits as to how much data you can get at a time. In theory, you can ask the, excuse me, ask the module, send me everything and it sends it in a sort of fairly haphazard and unreliable way. I found that if I ask for one field container at a time, which is always, I think at most 150 bytes or something like that, then I always get something. However, asking for some memory sounds simpler than it really is. What you actually do is on your um, output channel, you send a data request command, and then you listen for data set commands on your input channel. And in particular, you want to get a data set command that says, here is the data starting at address, whatever address you've asked for, with size, whatever, however many bytes you asked for. But there's no correlation between uh, this is the request and this is the response. And potentially, if I change my current kit just by... Um, using the the dial on the on the front of the module that will have sent a bunch of data set commands um across midi saying i've changed the current set i've changed the current set again etc so you need to kind of be aware and i've ended up with an async api that squirrels all this way encapsulates it all away by having to keep track of hey well what requests have i sent recently and Oh, I see I've got a data set command that, um, that corresponds with that. So let me just briefly actually show a little bit of code. Um, if we go into the MIDI project, so my Roland MIDI client, um, you say uh, request data async. So you say, I would like the data at this address and this size and what it actually ends up doing is it sends a data request message after putting on a queue of consumers. Um, well, this is the list of things that I'm expecting to get. And then um, if we ever do get it, then we can return that data. Um, otherwise, or if the user has canceled because they said I'm bored of waiting five seconds or whatever, then it needs to remove the, the queued up sort of request that we're waiting to be responded to um, and you know, return a, a cancelled task. So this was my very first challenge with interacting with the drum kit and it wasn't nearly this neat to start with. I mean this this still looks fairly low level gutsy stuff um, and if someone could say on the chat whether the code is actually readable at this font size or whether I would uh, whether it's best if I uh, up the font size a bit that would be really good you don't need to particularly understand this code just hey i've got some encapsulation here um so that i can asynchronously ask for um for data and uh that's the best i can get because 
MIDI doesn't really re uh, provide a request response um, protocol. Okay, so that's that's the protocol involved, and I also have the play note commands, etc. Um, but most of the time, I'm moving data around, and when I want to transmit data to the uh, to the device, so if I make a change locally in the v Drum Explorer, I want to be able to say, "Hey, we've got here. I can. Uh, I'll do the do it next time I demonstrate something. I could edit a kit and call it Liverpool." and then say, please copy that kit over to the drum kit, and then I should be able to um, move the camera a bit so that you can see the, the front of the module, and it will say, this is Liverpool. Um, for that, I send the data, and then wait a bit, and hope. There's nothing that comes back from the kit saying, yep, that's all fine, or um, you screwed up, by sending data to an address that doesn't exist. You know, the memory bank is theoretically enormous. It's, it's a 32-bit address range, but only a relatively small bit of it, about 450K, is useful. And it would be quite nice if the module could say, hey, you tried to set this data, that doesn't work. Um, but there's no such thing. And there's, no, there's nothing to say, yes, it's done now, so you can send some more data. If I just send all the data as quickly as I can, that fails. Uh, at the moment, I'm waiting 40 milliseconds. I have no idea whether I could make that 30 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds. It's relatively tricky to check. Because what I've got to do is transmit all the data, then load all the data back and check whether it looks like what I sent. Um, I should probably write a console app to test that at some point, but it's, it's a bit fiddly at least. Okay, um, I mentioned 7-bit addressing. So MIDI is a mostly 7-bit protocol with one bit as a sort of control bit at the start of each MIDI packet. Um, you have something with the top bit set and then again at the end. So that means not only are all of the values within memory only 7 bits, but also Roland decided that it would represent all the memory addresses as 7 bits as well. So most of the time, that's not too bad, but it does mean if you, if you just treat them as, let me bring up things again here, uh, if you treat these addresses as just hex addresses, if you add one, you know, increment by one, an address of, say, this kit two of 03020000, increment by one, that's fine, we get to 03020001. That's all good until you get to 03020007F. And if you add one more to that, you don't get to something ending with 80, you get to something ending with 100. And that might be in the middle of a field. That has caused me a lot of hassle. Um, and it feels annoying to me that Roland decided to make this pervasive as the address um, sort of model um, it took me a long time to work out how to fix this so that I wasn't using that, uh, so I wasn't correcting for that all over the place. Um, I'll give you a little bit of history of the VDRUM Explorer. So I started off, I started off with a console app just so that I could see, can I send some data? Um, can I get the current kit name? Can I change the current kit name? That kind of thing. And then I started building a WinForms app. Uh, with .NET Core 3 back when it was in preview. And I found um, the way that I built the WinForms app was really slow. Now this is partly because of the way I was building it. Every time I would move to a different screen within the VDrum Explorer, so uh, when I moved to a different tree node, it would create all the different Windows controls for a load of text boxes and whatever. Let me just... Um, start it again and this time i'll probably leave it running just for simplicity um so if i load the td27 kit uh or module rather um not only is the tree fairly large so there's the trigger banks i mentioned so i'm currently actually on the user bank but i've customized it a bit um but in each of these kits, we have a lot of information, and 
there's a lot, particularly when I go into edit mode, it becomes a little bit easier to tell. There are a lot of controls there, um, particularly a lot of controls if you start just moving around the UI. And even now it's being relatively slow, but it was much worse with WinForms than with WPF, which this is written in. And the reason for that is that WPF uses um, sort of synthetic controls. Each text box isn't actually a Win32 handle. Um, and uh, Windows Forms uses a real Win32 handle and they're relatively expensive to create. I've just seen, I've got a couple of um, questions in the, in the chat. Uh, why MIDI went seven bit is so that it can use the extra bit at the top as a control bit. So it can say, this is the start of a packet and I will assume the packet continues until I see another byte that's got the end of packet marker with the, the top bit set. This is a very old protocol. Um, these days, I would expect it to be a packet with a header saying, this is how many bytes are, are going to be in it. And then those bytes could be anything. But I at least believe that that's the reason for it. Um, okay, so it started off with, as WinForms. I then thought, well, WPF might be more efficient. And it turns out it was, but my first port of this to WPF was a very direct port of the WinForms. And because of the way I'd written it, which was um, not using any kind of binding, but just when I, when I change the, uh, when I change which, um, which tree view I'm looking at, which level of detail I'm looking at, um, I will just manually create by manually, programmatically create all the controls and um, add them into the panels and whatever. And you can do all of that in WPF, but it's not the way you want to do it. Okay, I can show you some of the code for that because I still have the old WPF project. Um, and it's all, it's mostly in Data Explorer, which is quite long, uh, 600 lines. It's, it's not as long as you might expect, but it's got all kinds of nasty stuff. So here we go. We create a label, set the margin padding and content, um, set the row. So this is the WPF version. I've deleted the, the WinForms version. Um, it's still in source control, you know, in the history. Uh, but this was all manual. And uh, anyone who is professional, a uh, professional application developer is probably now um, just cringing. And that's absolutely fine. So I am not an application developer. And um, that's one of the reasons I wanted to do this project so that I could learn more about application development and WinForms, WPF, etc. cetera. Um, I'm not gonna say that what I've got now is what a real application developer would do, but it's considerably nicer. In fact, I've got significantly more code now. Um, so instead of VDRUM Explorer, dot wpf the what we've got running is vdrum explorer dot gui and that just has some xaml files it's got a minimal amount of c sharp that i'll show you in a bit but it depends on the view model which has a bunch of things um significantly more code than the old i will generate it all manually and you know to heck with uh, encapsulation um and both of them have different uh non-ui bits. So uh, VDRM Explorer.data is the old version. And I thought, well, if I'm rewriting stuff to be more MVVM, I will also um, do a new model uh, sort of package. But they're, they're roughly equivalent. <coughs> um, so let me go back to the slides and find out what I was meant to be talking about. Okay, uh, I've talked about the schema. Um, I'll mention briefly overlays, and in fact, I'll demonstrate overlays. So when I started doing the, the WinForms app, I rapidly worked out that I, would, I should have something that's schema driven. So initially, I started by saying, you know, class kit, and a kit has these instruments, and started basically translating the schema into C sharp code. And about six hours later, I thought, that's a really bad idea. Let's represent the schema as a schema in JSON I happen to have used. Um, and I've gone through many, many iterations of this, but it's basically converting the PDF 
into a JSON representation. And then most of the user interface is driven from that schema with only a few bits of code that are very specific. But I ran into problems, two problems being overlays and conditional fields. Now, what I call an overlay is where there are multiple sort of field containers that get put into the same container, really. Um, so I've given an example of instrument parameters and they're described in the kit unit vedit field container as just, well, parameter one, parameter two, parameter three. These are all four byte parameters and the kit unit vedit container itself has no idea what they mean. But really, if you've got a kick drum, a kick um, instrument, then you get these three parameters and only these three, which are tuning, muffling and snare buzz. If you have a symbol, it would have a size. Different instrument groups have different, um, different things that you can configure. I will demonstrate this. So uh, currently um, I'm in a tom. So this main instrument has the main vedit, and vedit is Roland's name for making things change, um, uh, giving different pitch and things. Now this looks different to what I've just described. It's got shell depth instead of uh, tuning, and that's, I mean, it's got tuning as well. This is because this is the TD27, which has more configurability. But you can see that for a tom, we, we want to show that you can edit the shell depth, head type, tuning, muffling, and snare buzz. If I go to a uh, ride, so yes, we can choose which ride we use, um, and even changing which ride we use changes the size of it, but you can see we've got size, thickness, different kinds of muffling. So uh, on, a, on a kick drum, you might have donut muffling, I think, uh, let me see. Uh, oh, you've got tape, blanket, and weight, whereas, if I go back to the ride, um, then we've just got 19 different levels of tape. So that's how much tape you put on your ride symbol to muffle it a bit. Um, and we've got sizzle and all these interesting things. I must actually find out what sizzle and ping do at some point. Um, these all just change the sound a bit. But you can see this is, this is always the same main V edit, which values are present depends on the value of this instrument group. And there's another place where this happens a lot, which is in what's called multi effects. So this is the kind of special effects that you can apply. And you can see there are an awful lot of them. Um, the, the phasers are the most fun ones, I think. Um, and these have a bunch of fields as well. Um, and I'll come back. Remember this tempo sync. Um, field because that will be interesting and I need to need to make a note that I need to center the slider on the tempo sync. Um, I, I keep a little logbook of things to do. Tempo sync and I also wanted to disable MIDI channel and attack. Okay um, so the point is, this is another overlay field. Now in this case, the field that it depends on, the type field, is actually part of the same field container as the parameters. That's relatively straightforward, but when it comes to the, um, the instrument bits that I was showing before, this field container, the vedit, is entirely separate to the main instrument container. And so I needed to work out a way of saying, how do I refer to one field in a schema from a different field? Um, and do you know, right now, I can't remember offhand exactly how it works. So let's have a look. Let's have a look at the uh, Kitpad inst schema. So this is the, um, the instrument bit that we saw. We've got the instrument, the volume, the instrument bank is related to the instrument field, and I might come back to say how I've ended up um, referring to that. But you've got all these different things, and the instrument itself, um, that's just a four-byte uh, four value that ends up being a value from one to 358 or whatever it is, 
and you need to know as the programmer you know, as the schema designer that the different instruments are grouped together in the kit pav v edit i end up saying okay well the switch for i i think of the overlays as being a switch statement for am i looking at that overlay or that overlay or that overlay and so i've ended up with a switch path um think of all these field containers as forming a tree and i've had to invent syntax for variables so that if you're looking at kit if you're looking at the v edit for kit one um the main layer for trigger three which is probably the snare rim then you need to go to slash kit one slash kit pad main um brackets three because there's sort of an array of them in there um and then look at the instrument field and actually wiring all of that up has proved to be one of the trickiest bits so that's uh that's overlays and then there are these conditional fields if you remember i showed you in the um, multi-effects um i think i was looking at a phaser and it had a tempo and a tempo sync checkbox and depending on whether i had that checked or not it would show a time so a certain number of milliseconds or the notes like hemi demi semi quaver etc let me uh, go back to to show that so here we go so it's currently uh, 0 0.05 hertz that can go to six six hertz say um and i can tempo sync and if if tempo sync is turned on then these are the the valid values otherwise it's the the hertz um so sometimes it's hertz sometimes it's milliseconds but it turned out that uh these conditional fields where you don't want to display ever if i commit these changes you can see it, the rate is fixed as six hertz and if i edit it to be tempo sync um of uh dotted crotchet and commit then it knows that it's tempo sync instead of fixed there's no point in displaying the six hertz because that's not really interesting anymore in my earlier versions of this i had really complicated code that could make any field conditional on any other numeric field so it would say here's where the field is to be conditional on and this is the value um you know if that field is set to value x then this field is turned on and when i was rewriting this um this was one of the last things that i came up against and i thought what am i going to do about this it's relatively tricky to navigate from one field to another and then the ui side of it in mvvm didn't end up being nice either um if every field is conditional you always need to check all over the place it wasn't nice and then i looked carefully and i saw the only place in all of the schema for the old code that i ever used this was for tempo sync and tempo sync is always a boolean field um a time or frequency and then a note and they're always in the same order they're always four byte values even the boolean is a four byte value because it happens to be in this multi effects and it was far simpler to say i will just special case that i will say that a tempo sync field is its own kind of field you know just as you'd expect from a schema um there are different field kinds booleans um enums strings etc i will just make tempo sync its own thing and i will give it its own uh view model so we should be able to see um it's certainly got its own model within data fields uh tempo data field there we go um and so this can expose whether it is tempo sync or not the raw numeric value the musical note and the formatted text so it knows how to do it that's all within the model and then in the um uh view model uh we have an editable one of those that just knows how to it, it presents things slightly more pleasantly for the view and the view itself is able to switch on this and let me see in data explorer dum 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 uh, if i search for tempo we'll see okay so if we have an editable tempo data field view model then 
put it together as a text block and a checkbox and a combo box and a slider and a text block. And that feels very, very specific. And it really is. And you might think, well, why not make it all general purpose and all conditional? And it was because I only needed this. And doing this looks a bit ugly, but it's, you know, 11 lines of code here and, and the other bits of view model, and they do exactly what I want them to. So that was one of the later lessons that I learned was don't try to be too general, or it's fine to be very general, but when it becomes a problem, say, well, do I need this generality or am I only ever using it in a particular way? Okay, so I've mentioned the schema um, and I said that I started off by writing code then started rep representing it as data. Now, in theory, the, the ability to use it as data means that someone could use, if I ever release a 1.0 of the VDrum Explorer, um, I could expose the ability to say, uh, anyone else can write their own schema, excuse me, <coughs> write their own schema, tell me what device it's for, etc and have that in a plugins directory or whatever with no code and it would just work. I believe that would actually be feasible, but writing the schema is something that requires such in-depth knowledge of all of the rest of what's going on that I can't imagine it actually ever happening. And you know, for a long time until this year, uh, this only worked with the TD17 and the TD50, then Roland came out with the TD27. Uh, this was a really good excuse for me to spend more money and get the digital snare and digital ride and the nicer kit. I'm currently resisting buying a TD50 module on eBay. Um, but by having this as, uh, as a schema, I was able to fairly quickly, as in I was in a hotel room, uh, knowing that I would be going back from NordevCon uh, in Norwich to Reading where my TD27 was awaiting me as a parcel. I thought, I wonder whether I can get it so that it'll just work when I plug it in and get it to go on the Saturday morning. And it wasn't quite first time, but it was darn close. Um, and that was relatively easy. I could copy and paste bits from other schemas, look at the uh, documentation. And I think it would have been harder to do that as code. On the other hand, um, if you've got a view model that is able to bind directly to properties in code, it would probably be simpler in that sense for it to be all in code. Um, I don't know how well WPF works with the idea of, well, here's a class, please create a view that iterates over all of the items, all of the properties of the uh, class, in order and knows how to present each field. Um, I suspect I could do that with some more WPF wizardry, but it would be tricky. So I'm fairly comfortable at the moment with doing things as a JSON schema, but it's tricky. Then when you load the schema into memory, well, we don't want it just in its form in JSON. We want to resolve things and, and um, make everything tidy so that it's relatively easy to use from the rest of the code and in particular I wanted this to be um, immutable and that's where things started going not wrong necessarily but I started having some interesting questions so questions to ask yourself as I've got on the slide if you've got the representation of a field so I've got one of these tempo fields should that know which schema it's in it feels kind of useful in particular, imagine you've got um, a vEdit container. Uh, it would be useful for that to know which schema it's in so that it can go out from itself and navigate around to find the instrument field that it depends on. Remember, the, the overlay for a vEdit depends on what instrument is being represented in, in a different container. So it's really useful for a field to know about a schema. Um, and a container to know which schema it's in. It's also really useful for a schema to know which fields are in it. Um, it's pretty pointless as a schema. <laughs> what would a schema look like if you couldn't say, what containers do you have and what fields are in each of those containers? That all sounds good. How do I make this immutable? Because you've now got a cyclic dependency. The field knows about the schema, the schema has got to know about the field. Which do you construct first? If you construct the field first, 
how do you pass the schema into the constructor? Because if it's going to be immutable, then everything's got to be present in the constructor, right? It's tricky. Um, I went through significant hoops in the first versions um, and kept it relatively pure, um, as in pretty concretely immutable. But that meant that I was spending a lot of time on incomplete um, data because you know I was passing the schema in from the schema constructor into fields and hoping that the fields didn't try to access bits of the schema that weren't yet populated. It's not terribly nice. Um, and really quite ugly code to make sure that everything could be run within the context of a constructor. It's still fairly ugly in the new code, but a bit better than it was. And partly I'm cheating. So let me give you an example of where I'm cheating. Uh, so in my module schema, uh, we get a constructor. So this is a longer constructor than I normally like to use because and I've got a note saying, you know, populate everything apart from the fields first so that field construction can say, hey, what instruments do you have, etc. Um, but we populate most of it. And then right at the end, and in fact, it's in other code. Uh, I think it's within the code that creates containers. Um, just as a field would know eventually sort of what schema it's in. So, um, a container knows its parent container. If I look in the schema physical uh, container base, uh, so this has a parent and this is internally settable because I end up um, setting it. Let's see whether that will work. Um, oh, that never gets called, supposedly. Um, we, do, we do set it within, I think, the, the child things. Here we go, yes. For every container that I've been passed as my children, I will set its parent to me. That's not terribly nice in terms of mutability, but it's kind of what we've got. Um, so there are alternatives in, in C Sharp that would let me do this without any of that nastiness, but it's pretty ugly. Um, you know, it's already fairly ugly having a constructor with this many fields, uh, this many parameters, but it would be worse. Okay, uh, let me see. Um, so I've represented overlays and conditions. I think I've actually shown you most of that now. Um, one big question is whether I'm reinventing the wheel. Are there other tools that I could use? Obviously, I'm going to have to write the code that talks to the um, module. And one of the big surprises for me in doing this is I haven't seen any other software that is similar to what I'm building. There are um, some sort of kit library managery things where you have to take an SD card out of the kit because it's got an SD slot and you can copy things onto that, put it in your computer, load them up and look at the information and presumably edit, copy it back, etc. But I haven't seen anyone else using this, using it over MIDI. It does have a few limitations around samples, uh, but I was surprised to see that I'm the only person who thinks this is worth doing. However, if we could abstract out the MIDI part of things, my guess is that somewhere there is a really good app toolkit where you can say, here is my schema. Now, please show me the application. You know, here's the schema and here's some code to plug in when, I, when you need to load and save. Um, I don't know what that uh, app toolkit looks like. If anyone does know it, anyone on this call or um, if you're watching this on YouTube later on, add a comment. Uh, it would be really interesting to see what that looked like, because my guess is there will be some things that aren't as, aren't as easily represented. As an example, if I go back to Module Explorer, um, when I am within a kit node, um, but only a kit node, so this kit 40, I can right click and say, well, open that in Kit Explorer or copy to another kit. So I can say, uh, <coughs> copy that to kit number 39, uh, which is currently roots reggae slash rims with delay effects. And if I hit copy, you will see, you know, keep an eye on this bit of the screen, you'll see that becomes indie rock. And the triggers are as the indie rock ones were. Um, 
but that context menu only works on kit nodes because it's all about kit stuff. Um, there are other things, so this playing a note only works when I am on a particular trigger because we need to know which thing to, to, um, to play. Um, it doesn't currently change the current kit to the one that you've got selected there, uh, which maybe I should. But it, it does need to know um, whether it's playing a kick or playing a crash, etc. So I don't know in a generic app builder whether that would be available. Um, and all kinds of just, just little things like that. And I have no idea whether they would be able to represent the, you know, the multi FX type stuff um, with different, um, different parameters there and the tempo sync within that. Um, that feels like it's relatively rich functionality that would be hard to abstract out. However, it's very possible that I am reinventing the wheel here. And certainly I'm not trying to reuse anyone else's schema format, which is possibly a bad thing. Um, you know, I'm aware of JSON schema and things, um, but I believe that there are sufficiently many domain specific elements of what I'm doing that it's easier to just come up with my own. Okay. Uh, so, this is what I would normally get to, um, you know, maybe with 20 minutes left, I think I should probably wrap up in 10 minutes or so, partly to give my voice a rest. Um, I've talked about some of these. I will mention other, some other things I've learned. Um, documentation is really, really important. And uh, I've found two things about documentation one is i'm really really grateful for roland's documentation and the other is i've written some documentation myself so this is i promised i would show where things were in github um so this is the my demo code repo where if you look at the list of commits um it's almost all about drum stuff you know, this is just in the last three weeks so far there's lots and lots and lots of stuff. Lockdown has really kept me busy with um, the Drum Explorer. I do have other stuff there, but this is just somewhere that uh, Google has explicitly said, that's okay, John, you can do stuff for teaching and learning purposes, which this really is, um, and put it in there. So uh, if you go to github.com slash jskeet slash demo code, and I'll pop that into the chat in, in case anyone wants to, you should be able to build and I think <clears throat> uh, in drums, which is obviously where this all lives. Uh, yes, so I've got TD17 and TD27.vdrum files. Um, so even if you don't have a Roland vdrum kit, which I'm sure most of you don't, uh, you can still load up those and try playing around with them. There's only so much you can do. It won't actually be useful to you hey, maybe you want to make it look prettier and send me a pull request. That would be lovely, really lovely. Um, the other thing that I've got here is documentation. I have written my own documentation because I thought, well, I want to learn more about the app lifecycle. And part of that includes writing some documentation. It's a page, but it's in a fair amount of depth. This is all for the old code base but you can see it really looks very, very similar to, um, to what you've seen today. Basically, when I do finally move over to the new one, the view model based one, uh, I will be uh, just updating a load of pictures. Uh, the Instrument Audio Explorer has uh, changed more than anything else, I think. That's where you, you can take a saved copy of um, a bunch of the sounds and play them all individually so that you can build up your kit even if you're a long way away from your physical drum kit. So I learned the importance of writing um, documentation myself and the other thing you really really need to do um, if you're going to build an app for someone is have a Windows installer. So this took a fair amount of time and um, I think it's, uh, I can't remember it's Six Angels, Angel Six, Six Angels, YouTube, C Sharp, uh, Angel Six. So Angel Six had a good Wix um, uh, video that I used um, and that was, that was great. Um, 
So I built a Wix installer and then I tried to install it and it said, oh, I don't trust you. You don't have a certificate. So then I had to go into um, finding a or buying a personal development certificate. So this is a little bit like the certificates that you that are now effectively obsolete because of um, Let's Encrypt. Um, but these personal certificates are much more about the individual and the company. So Let's Encrypt basically says, well, okay, I don't really know who's issued this certificate, but this, this server has access to it. Um, so you can safely trust that you have a good connection to this server, um, good encryption there. Whereas an installer is really about when you hit the install, it says, this was built by Jonathan Skeet, because that's my legal name. Um, do you trust Jonathan Skeet to have stuff on your machine and he won't nuke it? And hopefully you all would. But in order to get that certificate, I didn't just have to pay money. I had to provide my birth certificate and passport and a bunch of other documentation, take it round to a notary who I also had to pay to prove who I was to the certificate company. Um, and this was all new experience for me. And whenever you've got new experience, you're learning. So I've really enjoyed all of this massive experience because so much of it was new to me. I'd done a bit of WPF before, done a bit of WinForms. Um, I certainly hadn't done nearly as much with view models as I now have. And I set myself the challenge for this of, I, I haven't used any of the many MVVM toolkits around um, I don't have, in my WPF project, da, 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 I depend on, uh, so in GUI, I depend on the view model directly. The view model depends on the model and on MIDI and on Proto. So I'm using Protobuf for the file formats. I depend on N-Audio. Obviously, I depend on Node Time. Need to update my Node Time dependency. In fact, I'll just start doing that now because I released Node Time 3 over the weekend, or last weekend. Um, and the model itself, uh, model depends on MIDI now, and MIDI depends on uh, async interfaces, uh, logging abstractions, and system link async. But that's all, uh, and, and the, the MIDI thing itself. So nowhere there is there anything that's here's how you can get around all of WPF's limitations. I wanted to find out about those limitations for myself and I've got some dirty hacks. So um, what do you do in MVVM um, and apologies to any of you who really aren't interested in WPF uh, although I will be porting this to Maui that's just been announced that will be the the next portable all singing, all dancing, supports MVVM and other um, architectures. Um, but in MVVM, how do you cope with one window wants to open another window? You want to put all your logic into the view model. So how do I do it so that when I've finished doing the, if I bring up the um, open copy and kit explorer, the command that's executed there is in the view model and yet it creates a new dialogue. How does it do that? So I've ended up injecting um, what I call view services. So this is stuff that really is user interface based. And it's just, you know, show the kit explorer given a kit explorer view model, show the module explorer. And I pass this into the view model to say, okay, well, when you need to do something that's really UI specific, call me back in this way. And that way, the um, we don't have a site click dependency because the view services themselves, the, the interface for this is defined in the view model um, project. So it says, these are the things that I need anyone, any user interface to, to do for me. And um, the implementation of it is in the view project. In theory, this makes this project testable. So I could test that when I execute the um, open a copy in Kit Explorer, it does actually open Kit Explorer and passes in a view model that has the right kit in, etc. So my code is all pretty testable. It is not actually tested at all. Um, I, I have a test project 
Uh, so viewmodel.test has a single empty unit test and model.test um, has, oh, that has a very few notify change recorder. Uh, oh yeah, that, so that's a helper class. Um, and I have one test that says, can we load the schemas? And I have a string test where most of it's commented out because I changed the design and I couldn't be bothered to fix the tests. Um, so I mentioned that because I can get away with it for a hobby project. I would like to write some tests when I get round to it. I value testability because that feels like it's designed the right way. If I, if I can test it, then um, later on, if I end up with problems that are hard to get to the bottom of just in an ad hoc way, I can write some tests. But I haven't actually written those tests. Um, I'm in no way saying that you shouldn't write unit tests, integration tests, etc. I'm just saying that hobby projects are a bit different and I have limited time and I've felt that my time is best spent writing the production code. Maybe there are some, I've definitely run into bugs and maybe those bugs would have been found earlier if I've run no, written tests to start with. But you get to choose. Um, so if you want to do, and maybe what you want to learn about, I wanted to learn about app design. I know how to write tests. Um, I'm not saying I wouldn't have learned anything about testability and tests in this project, but there's much more to learn because I'm so ignorant about app development. If you've done a load of app development before, but as it happens, not written any unit tests, then no shame, that's fine. Um, maybe you want to make your next project and say, from now, from the start, I'm going to make this testable and have 95% test coverage and have to work out how to get test coverage and, and things like that. It's all about saying, what am I trying to get out of doing this hobby project? I was trying to learn about app development, um, have fun with my drum kit, because you know, by, by having fun coding for the drum kit, I have more motivation to actually play the drum kit as well. Um, I want to be able to do, to actually use my application. As it happens, there are other people who do want my application, so I do occasionally get feature requests and things. Um, so you know, I have motivation there. But mostly it's so that I can enjoy coding and learn about things. You know, if I ever need to write an installer or need to use a certificate that I, that I get for work, I will be a lot, in a lot better position to do so. Okay, um, I'm going to, uh, oh, I have one more thing to demo, which is the importance of portability. So I have a console app as well. If I run .NET run, it will tell me all the commands I can run. And I wanted this to be partly a way of sandboxing stuff. Sometimes I would initially test code by um, writing a console app that would display things easily. Um, but I've got all of these different commands. So if I do list devices, um, it will show me all the devices on my system and try to detect them as a, a VDRUM module, etc. So we can see it's detected only one input device, but two output devices, it will find the two with the same name. So what have I got on the 5-TD27? Oh look, we've got this, which is a TD27. Um, if I, I won't actually turn on my um, TD17 because that may well screw up the microphone and, and speaker output, uh, but then it would detect both of them and say, well, that's fine, you've got two. But this is actually a genuinely useful application because of the turn pages note command. Um, so that will take a little bit to start. In the meantime, I will just move my camera or actually I will switch cameras. I'll stop. Um, you can see it's listening for mid MIDI note and the rest will be fairly boring. I'm just going to switch to that um and change camera so that you can use the camera from the surface there we go oh, you still can't see the, the screen i i have a screen over here um and currently it is showing the pdf of some sheet music for bon jovi's living on a prayer which is a fabulous piece to play um i will not be playing uh because i don't want to torture you however there are four pages of music here that are uh, shed across, um, split across 
um, the two pages up. So I've got it two up, and I just need to remember to go over and give this focus. So basically, um, I'll be happily drumming away. I can normally drum better than that. But then I want to change the page. Now I could reach from my keyboard, and that would be really annoying. Um, but I, as it happens, I have an extra drum, which if I lift, you can hopefully see um, near the, so the normal drums are here, and I've got an extra drum just there. Hopefully you can see. And you can see it's not at a place where it's easy to get at at all. Um, it's, it's not something you would, you would want to be actually playing regularly. But what I can do is listen for, uh, just as I listen for data set commands, I can listen for MIDI notes being played and say, well, whenever I hear this AUX3 being hit, I will change the page. Now you can't see it, but please trust me, that changed the page number. So if I had 10 things, I could be drumming away and just dum, da -da -da -da, dum, and it gets to change the page. That is actually the most practical single application of um, the V-Drum kit code so far. Um, but it's also a good proving ground for saying, yeah, this really is, uh, the model is, relatively general purpose um, compared with um, the the view model is really based on what the application looks like but the um, the model isn't and I can use that code within the console so one of the things I'm going to do over the weekend is try to remove a bunch of code from the console because I should now have it in the model um, and that's been good fun as well. So I'm gonna stop now and see whether there are any questions. Um, yeah, I, I've already stopped sharing, so I shall just stop speaking instead. Yeah, it was absolutely fantastic that, John. Uh, I was just thinking at the end where you had the, um, the drum, um, which changed the page. If, um, if, the, if it knew which uh, song you were playing, you could probably listen out for um, a set of notes and Ooh. change it just at the end. That's really interesting. If it could, yeah, that would rely on me being accurate. It would have to be sort of, so maybe, oh, I've been, <laughs> I've been waiting for a long time. I've been to various machine learning things. I'm just going to move this over so that I, I can see you and I'm not looking to the side. Um, so I've been waiting to find a genuine use for machine learning uh that that i would have i know that there are plenty of them out there but i've never really felt compelled to do any machine learning maybe the thing should, to do is record myself playing this piece 12, 20 times and say that's where i need to change and then feed it into a machine learning algorithm and then it can just change the page automatically that would be awesome that would be fantastic <laughs> absolutely fantastic uh, have we got any questions from anybody um in the chat Thank you for indulging me, everyone. As you can see, it's, it's, it's all about me, this one. It's what I find fun and what I've learned and found interesting. But as I said before, the point is for you to then say, oh, well, there was that pro other project that's probably got nothing to do with drums. It would be astonishing to me if any of you happen to have a project like this in your back pocket, but you may well have something else, whether it's a robot or a webcam that does stuff. Go have fun. It's great. <laughs> So we've got one from uh, Ma uh, Martin here. Um, how many lines of code Ooh. have you written and how long has it taken? Uh, so I've written a lot of code and deleted a lot of code. Um, I'm not going to sort of do a word count now, but there are certainly several thousand lines of code in there and many of them have been written many times, um, particularly on the schema front. Uh, I've gone back and forth on various different things, partly because early on I had an optimization problem where um, there are a lot of duplicate fields. So imagine you've got 100 kits and 24 instruments, and each instrument has two fields, a main instrument and a sub-instrument, um, and that has the same set of fields. So do you create a new object for each of those thousands of fields and end up with you know, 200 megs of memory uh, that is just these field objects, or do you try to be a bit more um, efficient about it? And I've probably gone too far on the efficiency front and I need to revisit that again, but I've done it so many times. In terms of time that it's taken, 
Oh, it's a lot of time. Um, this has been my main coding hobby now for the best part of a year, but I have gained so much pleasure from it and, and so much extra experience. Um, have a look on the GitHub page. You, you can clone it all and have a look there how much code there is and then undelete some of the projects that, that were deleted in earlier commits. Um, and just one from me as, uh, as well, John, but it'd be just nice to know, like, you've, you've always got a lot of projects on at the same time. So you've got, you've also released a new version of Node of Time um, and you've got this project and you've got, you, you know, you're working for Google. How do you manage your, uh, your, your sort of uh, project switching and do you find that uh, quite easy to switch between them? So I do. I'm rubbish at genuine multitasking, but I'm very good at context switching. It's something that has always been, um, or certainly since being at Google, I've noticed that I can switch context more easily than many of my colleagues. And that has led me into a role at work where I have my fingers in many, many pies. Um, and it seems to, the number of pies seems to increase all the time. Um, so you've got to be good at context switching. Fortunately, I am. Um, and to some extent, it, it can be switching just like that. So uh, this is relatively rare that during the week I'm looking at um, the VDrive Explorer. But come Saturday morning, um, in lockdown, I haven't been sleeping terribly well. So I will probably be getting up at six again anyway. And I will be coming to the shed and either coding on VDrive Explorer or my Zoom director. So um, as we were talking about just before everyone else arrived, um, I do church services, I sort of direct them from the shed, um, and I've written my own app that uses the Zoom SDK, so that instead of when I, you may have noticed a bit of a pause when I shared my screen earlier on, I was looking at the dialogue, find the right screen, make sure I've got all the options correct and stuff. It's really um, distracting to a congregation if you do that during a church service. So instead I've got my own little app, which uh, if I, if I find the right window, I could just launch it. Uh, dum, dum, dum. Is it going to launch? Okay, so let me put that on. In fact, that screen's probably a good one for it to be on. Um, <clears throat> so give us a, a second to open things up. Um, So if I now share my screen again, and if I share screen two, so this is the, has that shared the right one? Yep. Um, <clears throat> so this is what I have in front of me during, uh, during a service. And um, it's got features of, it's got these, these different things that we were doing um, during uh, during the service and I can double click on one of them and it launches YouTube, starts screen sharing and mutes things. Um, it also has the ability I can load a rename file, um, which some people, some of our congregation join via phone. So it's just got phone numbers to names and when people join, it just renames them automatically. Really handy. It's got a little subscription thing. So, uh, people can send a private chat message to me, which is really to my application. I'll stop the screen share now. Um, uh, it's really to my application. And if they say subscribe to joins, then it tells them every time anyone joins. And that's really useful in a church service. We've got 77 people or whatever, uh, 70 odd screens joining. And it's nice for people to be greeted by name, by a human being to say, oh, hi Joyce, how are you? Haven't seen you for a while. And if you have just a few people who have subscribed to all the joins and they get a little time stamped thing, they can say, okay, well, I see that Steve and Carol have been greeted, but Joyce hasn't. So I will make a point of saying hello and welcome to Joyce. So I've really enjoyed doing that as well. And that's been, that and the VDrum Explorer have been what I alternate between over the weekends. Um, but yeah, I, I just managed to context switch fairly, fairly quickly. Um, it's not something I could give tips about particularly, but it's just a skill that I have. And I would probably encourage people to think about whether it's a skill that they do have. And if so, use that because it's relatively rare to some extent, I think. Um, and if you let your colleagues know that you are interruptible because you'll be able to get back into your sweet spot quickly, 
um, then that provides extra value to people. That's, that's fantastic, John. Thank you so much for your time this evening. Um, it's My been pleasure. Great. It's, it's always fun. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, we've got um, the uh, reshopping giveaway, which I'll hand over to Shania now. Um, just to um, hand that one out. Shania? Yeah, um, I just got to share my screen. Hang on. Uh, so we've only had um, three people enter it. I think I'm sharing the screen. Yeah, I'm sharing the right one. <laughs> we've only got three people entering. I've done it by Twitter username because not everyone's got the whole name on it. So I'm just going to click now and see who the winner is. So, David, um, you got the Resharper license. Um, Josh, would you be able to send that over to him? Definitely. Thank you very much, Shania. Congratulations. So, yeah, thank you, everybody. And thank you, John, for your time. Um, it's been absolutely mm -hmm. brilliant seeing that project. Uh, I work a lot with, with, uh, with Jason Schemers, and I'm definitely going to give your projects a, a look. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> if I can, I'll, I'll probably contribute with some unit tests for you. Oh, that'd be <laughs> awesome. Thank you. <laughs> well, ha I hope you all have a good and enjoy your evening. And I will, I'll see you all next time. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye, folks. <laughs>